uh, one of our citizens, Mr. Coleman, along with the mayor and county for supporting this organization. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're looking at what's in the best interest of our citizens and our police officers alike. Having this sort of transparency certainly goes a long way in terms of helping us to build that sense of trust and legitimacy that we want to see in our organization. Uh, when we sit down and we talk with citizens like Mr. Coleman, they're insisting on change in law enforcement. And that's extremely important that, we, that we're prepared to listen and that we're prepared to respond to those concerns. Uh, any police department today that's not willing to involve and listen to their community will certainly be left behind as police uh, move forward uh, as a profession. And so again, I want to thank the mayor and council for their support. Uh, certainly our police department, we consider to be among the best in the region. We're going to continue to build this organization with the um, best practices uh, in mind. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring forward Mr. Coleman at this time uh, to have a few uh, words as well. Thank you, Marcus Coleman, M-A-R-C-U-S, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, founder and president of Save Ourselves. Would like to, uh, to take this moment and uh, thank the two individuals here with me today, uh, Chief Meadows, along with Councilwoman Willis. Happy birthday. Uh, I won't repeat some of the things that are said that have already been said, but I will say this. Uh, being one that has had the honor to assist uh, an array of families, families who uh, have suffered tragedies in our literally high-profile cases. Uh, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Kendrick Johnson, uh, the list is literally too many to name. But being on the other end, meaning that when you have a lot of these maimings or killings by law enforcement, one of the uh, uh, standard operating procedures is that the victim is tested. There's a toxicology report and we find out what is in that victim's system. Well, I love the fact that I'm in a city that voted unanimously to test for alcohol and drugs as it relates to the officer or officers that would have caused the baby or killing of an individual because it is under the umbrella of transparency. I want to make sure this is important. This is the epitome of local government, local law enforcement, and advocacy working together for the betterment of the community. This is not a gotcha moment to law enforcement. This is a way for the city of South Fulton in those cases of tragedy, whether right or wrong, this isn't about a person's guilt or innocence, the victim or the officer. This is an opportunity for the city of South Fulton and their police department to confidently stand behind an officer saying that that officer operated and acted of sound mind and body. I want you to understand how important that is. There's video after video after video that we feel as advocates and spokespersons and organizers of families that an officer's behavior is erratic, which makes it suspicious. Here is a way for us to check off that concern. Full transparency, everybody should understand this to be a low-hanging fruit. It eases tension as it relates to the community and police. I'll close with this. The adoption of this legislation, I am personally calling on on behalf of a national coalition that other major municipalities adopt this legislation, starting with the city of Atlanta. If we're truly going to heal the wounds between police and the community, we must have full transparency as it relates to the community, but to the police as well. Very proud to be in the city of South Fulton that has now implemented that step of transparency and look forward to others adopting that. Thank you. Now what we do have right now in the city of South Fulton, if an officer is involved in an accident, 
whether uh, at fault or not, that person is drug tested. So what this what this policy does, it takes a little step further and it includes officer involved shootings and other use of force um, that might be necessary uh, over the course of an officer's duty. Were you all doing use of force at your jurisdiction? Yes, we were. And also the uh, 21st century police principles. As we go about building this police department, there's, there's, there's six different pillars uh, with respect to uh, the 21st century policing model. And so what we're doing is embedding those principles in every aspect of this organization. All six of them. All six of them. So that means you're going to be starting a citizens review board for the first time. Absolutely. And when will that start and when will that be? Well, that's going to require legislation on behalf of the elected. And so we'll kind of leave that timetable up to them or Councilwoman Willis wants to uh, chime in on that. Uh, certainly, uh, when they sit down and start looking at, at various uh, review boards nationally and how they, they're, they're implemented, we certainly want to make sure we're getting best practices with respect to that. You guys have uh, been at the forefront of some other legislation. You guys implemented the Eight Can Wave. You've mm -hmm. also done a lot of other solutions. And now this, you know, why, um, why do this? Why are you guys wanting to be at the forefront of all of this? So, as a police chief, um, in a city, in the fifth largest city in the state of Georgia, I don't have the luxury of distancing myself from the injustices that we're seeing nationally, right? I think it's important that we be thought leaders and, and try to set a model for other jurisdictions to follow. Even though we haven't had those sort of issues here, I think it's important that we model uh, the type of uh, policing agencies that we want to see nationally. And, and as I said earlier, uh, police departments that aren't willing to evolve from this point forward, they're going to wind up being left behind because the public is insisting on change. And, and so we're trying to model what that change should look like in the city of South Florida. How many police-related shootings have you all had uh, that have been fatal? None. Is there a dollar figure attached to this? No. Uh, many of these are policies that are actually just require training things of that nature and so we're looking at that. We certainly are trying to use uh, technology as a way to create more efficiencies and create uh, safety for our officers and so those are the sort of things that we'll be looking at and, and as you know part of the 21st century policing model deals with the use of technology. We don't just want to invent technology in this, in this organization, we want to make sure that we're not misusing that technology together. and so it's important that the policies behind that technology is, is extremely important. How many officers do you have, and what's been their reaction to this? Uh, how do they do? So right now we have 154 police officers, and because we started off with those 21st century policing principles, it's really commonplace for our police officers. Uh, the other day I was looking at a, a Facebook post uh, where uh, a police chief made a comment that another police that a, um, a police chief caved to political pressure. And he was talking about me because I, we were requiring our police officers in the 8th can't wait to give warnings uh, prior to shooting. Well, if you think about, or if most police officers know that we go through a state-mandated court. And in that state-mandated court, when you get down to the three-yard line, you're required to say, police, halt, drop your weapon. That's a warning. These are things that we're doing anyway. And so when a police chief starts digging in, um, and trying to put another face on policy that we have in place. There's no, there's no place in the police for people like that anymore. So we want to make sure that as we grow and we're modeling that behavior, as I say, and trying to create the, um, uh, the difference in policing that we want to see. I'm sorry, Gary, did you see? You were mentioning transparency, you know, the, the Citizen Review Board, you were mentioning technology. One of the other great tenets of this in the 21st century policing is updated reporting of crime stats. Can you right. speak to a little bit about that? Right, and so one of the things that we put in place um, uh, when I first came through is that we're making sure that we put really comprehensive crime statistics out on our website, not just for our police officers, but we want to educate our citizens on our crime patterns and trends so they can kind of serve as the eyes and ears uh, for our uh, police officers as they're out in the street. That way, we're all singing from the same city meeting update those crime statistics regularly. And I'm proud to say uh, so far this year, uh, even with everything that we've put in place, the city of South Fulton is down 19% in overall crime. And we, we need those numbers to continue to go down as we still have a long way to go with respect to our crime fighting strategies. 
but we also uh, are pleased that we're headed in the right direction. right in Georgia. I, I want to be clear about that. And But I think what we're not doing is a very good job of educating our public on the things that we are getting right. And so I think that's extremely important for us as a profession, you know, moving forward. In the 34 years that I've been in law enforcement uh, in the Atlanta metropolitan area, I've never been taught neck restraints, ever, in 34 years. And so I think it's important that we highlight uh, those sort of uh, things that we're, that we're getting right, uh, not just in South Fulton, but uh, throughout the state. Uh, systemically, and, and so I think that's extremely important to us. And my last question, how do you tie in what you guys have done before and what you've done? How does the HIV tie into the big program? So it's all part of, of the same thing. When you think about uh, community-oriented policing, when you think about uh, building a sense of trust and legitimacy, which is one of the six pillars, all of those uh, principles from the eight can't wait actually uh, merge into to an overall uh, strategy that we're looking to implement. Uh, when we're starting, when we talk about modeling, uh, a lot of that has to do with community input. You see we have Mr. Coleman, and we have other uh, community members that are essentially telling us how they want to be policed. And it's not whether or not we make arrests in certain areas or write tickets, but what values uh, our community wants to see in this police department. And that's what we're looking at doing, taking those values and putting police resources around them. What is the eight can't wait? So the eight can't wait is it deals with eight different um, eight different scenarios by which uh, police departments are being asked to adjust their policies and programs. Um, uh, they're, they're dealing with a lot. Can be deemed anti-police, but I'm not anti-police. I'm anti-bad policing. It's very important for me personally to state what type of chief that I personally see in Chief Metal. He's not necessarily a unicorn, but he is rare. Let's make no mistake about it, there is an issue with policing as a whole in the country. But it will behoove more police departments, more chiefs, more heads of departments to be willing to accept the data, be willing to open their door to community leaders, in the community period and who will be willing to implement change. I've had nothing but a good relationship with this gentleman. We have both agreed that we're not going to always agree, but we're always going to be respectful. And again, I will bring it back to the new city, fifth largest in the state, third largest in the county, a force to be reckoned with. At this point in time, there are no fatalities or controversial shootings. We know that there will be some in the future. And so getting out in the forefront of this, it speaks volumes. The relationship between the community and police, especially the black community, is in need of repair. And it takes individuals in leadership of law enforcement with the character like a Chief Meadows. Last point on local government. We have a black mayor here in the city of South Fulton, seven black African-American council members, several positions that are filled by African-Americans. That's not to say that we do not welcome all, but we have some unique, we have a unique vantage point for the makeup of this city that we know is a systemic problem that targets the black community. So again, I just applaud Chief Meadows and I applaud Councilwoman Willis and the mayor and council that voted unanimously in favor of this, plus the other things that you have mentioned. South Fulton can truly be a beacon of how community and police works together, and we hope that there's a domino effect. What is the racial makeup of the city of South Fulton? We are over 90% African American. 